welcome each one of you today. We're glad you're here. And uh, I wanted to take just a minute before Pastor Rick gets up and ministers today uh, to talk about, uh, obviously, you guys have probably been watching the news a little bit and seeing what's going on in Israel. And uh, my, my, Ayla, you need to, well, that's okay. There's, there's a lot of other places and it's, yeah. But anyway, so this has been going on. I've been kind of watching it pretty close since yesterday morning. And uh, I have, uh, I, I want to read you, and, and I, I, I tell you this, so you know a little bit exactly how to pray. We spent uh, quite a while in the van coming home from the ladies' meeting uh, yesterday afternoon in prayer concerning this. And so I want to give you a firsthand uh, report. This was actually yesterday, but this is a gentleman that I actually met when I was over there and got the chance to uh, talk to a little bit, and he's up on the uh, northern border. And, and, and those of you know that with Israel, there really is three main factions, three main areas that the attacks uh, come from when they come to Israel. And one is being the, uh, the uh, Gaza Strip, which is in the southwestern part of Israel. It's a strip right along the Mediterranean, clear down uh, on the lower edge, bordering Egypt. Uh, that is a lot of Hamas, uh, uh, Palestinians in that area as well. And um, so that's one area. Another area then of is uh, uh, on the northern part, which is uh, uh, up around the, the Golan, um, which is uh, where we see a lot of Hezbollah uh, is uh, stationed there a lot, which used to be where Syria was uh, took up their residence in the attacks there. But years ago, then uh, Israel began to work with uh, uh, Syria, even when they attacked Syria, they would bring the Syrians over into Israel and take care of their wounded and everything, because Syria didn't have hospitals, even in the midst of this battle, and would nurse them back to ha health and then turn them back, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to Syria. And, and what that did is it produced relations within them in Syria, Israel and Syria, because they realized this, that Israel wasn't what they thought that they, or what they were told that they was. And so, actually, uh, Israel and Syria began to get good relations. They worked together for several years, and things were, were actually pretty good. But then they moved further north, and when they did, then they created a vacuum, and Hezbollah moved in. So they saw the opportunity, uh, the, uh, the terrorist group Hezbollah, and, and basically Hezbollah is, is funded. All these, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, all these are, are uh, factions are um, funded through Iran case you don't know that the and, and 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 sadly we are funding a lot of that have funded it in the past and that's what's so aggravating and we as as uh, uh, Kufi have uh, worked a lot and very hard on that to try to get as much of that stopped as possible but the Biden administration has funneled many funds to Iran that's being used to supply uh, ammunition to supply war goods basically for Iran to fund these different terrorist groups. So just kind of giving you a little information in case you don't know. And so that's the, 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 the northern uh, 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 sector up there. And then we have the West Bank, which is right uh, uh, beside uh, uh, Jerusalem, just to the east of Jerusalem, uh, which is, includes Bethlehem uh, and areas of Jordan and whatnot in, in that area. And so there's, there, so, uh, so the, basically, if you know Israel is kind of along, uh, and the Mediterranean's over here, then you've got down at the lower edge over here, uh, you, you've got uh, uh, Gaza, and then north of that, you've got the the northern heights, the Go uh, Golan Heights up there, and then over to the east side there is then the West Bank, and so they're basically surrounded on all three areas. Well, right now the attacks that you've been hearing about coming from Gaza, which is uh, uh, over on the Mediterranean to the south. Um, we, when we were there, we went to, um, well, we went all over Israel, but there's uh, uh, Storo, uh, and, uh, uh, which is the town closest to, um, uh, uh, to, to Gaza. I mean, you can look in you can see the border wall right there. I mean, it's within a mile. 
And so those people in that area in Ashkodod, which is just north of there and some of the, the border uh, uh, cities there, are within five seconds of a missile. So you can tell that when a missile goes off, the Iron Dome can't uh, intercept it that quick. Uh, and so the f ones further away, they've been able to intercept a lot. And of course, then what's happened, you know, the Iron Dome is very expensive to operate uh, for thousands and thousands of dollars for every one that they send up to intercept a missile. And uh, uh, Hamas's and, and uh, Hezbollah and all those, th their missiles that they have are very, uh, 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 are, are very cheap to build. So, uh, so you can see, you can see there where uh, Gaza is at on the left-hand side, that area. And then uh, you can see over the West Bank over here, and then, uh, which is Jerusalem is right beside that. And then you've got the, uh, the northern uh, 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 part up there. So, um, so they have just flooded thousands and thousands, and I don't know what the current count is. It's too many to, to even uh, uh, put a number on that they have uh, released on Israel and have uh, there's been a, a lot of a uh, lot of killings and everything uh, through that and what's happened what kind of uh, fueled this was that uh, uh, even though in Gaza they are uh, you know they're they're all in that area, and, and Israel has put a wall around it, a security wall. They call it a security fence, but it's a concrete wall. They even even dug down, uh, I don't know, like 30, 40 feet underground and poured concrete so they couldn't bore under uh, these, this wall. Well, uh, they are overcrowded in that area, uh, even though it don't look that big, and but they, they've there's more people that has come in and, and, and into uh, Gaza, and it's they build it up, and it's and and so they're they're frustrated that Israel won't give them more land. Yeah, yeah it's one 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 point seven eight or something like that. I think is correct, but pretty close. Yeah, and so uh, so since Israel won't give them anymore, their frustration, they're going to say okay, this is what started a lot of this, is their attacks on Israel and say, we want, we want more. And Israel says, no, because of who their terrorist actions. I mean, when we were there, I don't know if you guys remember, I, w I showed you a picture of a, uh, of a uh, uh, looked like a real colorful caterpillar that was in the town of Stro, which was uh, just right there, that when... Uh, uh, whenever they have attacks or whatever the children can run into for protection. And uh, it's because uh, uh, they only have just seconds, a matter of seconds, whenever the, the alarm goes off to them. Well, uh, they, okay, let, let me just read. So, so this come from even, uh, uh, so this gentleman was at a site up in the north, northern uh, area of, of Israel. And what they do is they're constantly monitoring, they're constantly getting intel. And they're watching like Facebook and Instagram and all the social media sites and the other sites that they have there. That's, and, 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 and they have people in uh, Gaza and different places feeding them intel. And so they're always constantly working out scenarios what could happen. Now, there's a lot that said that, you know, this was taken by surprise, which if you'll notice that all, it seems like every attack that happens, they do it on a holy day, of uh, one of Israel's holy days, so that, so that they're distracted. They purposely do that. Well, uh, so this gentleman and his crew up there, they're constantly running scenarios. As a matter of fact, when we was there, we split up into four different groups, and they gave us scenarios, and we had to work out a solution to them. And we gave us the info. They gave us the books of all. This is what you have to work with, and this was real stuff. And how would you handle this? And then, based off of that, they gave us, showed us a video of what could have happened with our decisions that we made. And it's just like no matter how you figure this, there's always going to be some pushback from it. And so, anyway, this is what they're constantly, uh, uh, um, you know, dealing with. So I'm going to read this from him. He says. Uh, 
Um, uh, he says this is his, uh, his uh, take or his what he saw in the attack on the Moshav this morning, which is down uh, right there by the border. At 6.40 in the morning, one of my friends, one of the uh, immediate response team, went for a walk outside. He saw in the sky a paraglider, like a motorized parachute in a way. He tried to shoot them. They were too high. They landed in the Moshav. Once they got off those things, they immediately entered started going out. Three of my members of the immediate response team went outside and they were shot at that very moment. They uh, we had about 400 missiles landing all around uh, Netiv, uh, Hasara, which has made which has made it impossible to go outside which is another community pretty close to there and try and seek any help or try to fight them. That has been since 6.40 a.m. in the morning. That was their time yesterday and they're eight hours ahead of us. Uh, the time in Israel now is 2.35. There is still an ongoing fight. People are still trapped in their homes. The army, the government is trying to go house by house to make sure there are no more terrorists. As we speak now, they found a few more terrorists. There is some shooting going on, and that is what I hear from the ground, endless noises of explosions, shooting and yelling in Arabic since 6.40 in the morning. The media response team is about 50 of us, give or take, who are trained and armed in the army as if we are reserve soldiers, but not like normal reserve soldiers that have their combat gear in their unit. We have our combat gear in our possession, and so if needed, we can respond within uh, a few minutes, within a minute, which means I have my M16, which is a military rifle, and my bulletproof vest and all of that, which is military equipment, and once called, we respond. The idea is we are all residents of the Moshav. We live here. The army trains and equips us, and when needed, we respond. Actually, a bunch of the people, I would say half a dozen of those who were murdered today, were members of this community of the immediate response team who went outside to try to fight the terrorists. They were outnumbered and taken by surprise. So they're waiting on confirmation of the deaths, and the fighting is still going on. And he'll, he's in touch with his friends on the ground there and will continue to keep us posted on updates. So uh, it's, it's hard to imagine what they're living under until you're there and to see it. And uh, so what, what can we do? Obviously, we can pray. And uh, uh, the good thing about it is it does look like the, our government is saying, we stand behind you, Israel, to do whatever you need to to protect yourself, but it's yet to be seen what actions is going to be taken from us as far as, uh, you know, we build, we build the Iron Dome for them, in case you didn't know. They buy, uh, we, we, we give them uh, funding. They, in turn, uh, pay the United States, Israel pays the United States to build the Iron Dome, and uh, so the money's lost three-quarters of, of, of the funds that's given for that comes right back to the U.S. And so uh, we're uh, uh, praying that uh, funds are released uh, in that area. There's plenty of funds being released for things that uh, we won't get into that uh, uh, needless, uh, but this is something and we're just believing that uh, those that are, uh, that are truly allies of Israel will step in and step up. And Israel has taken the stance that no matter what it takes, we're at war, and we're gonna. Uh, you've you've opened a can of worms, and we're not we're not gonna close it until it's it's taken care of. And so, uh, sadly, uh, the uh, uh, Hamas has went into many homes and and killed off uh, uh, residences and children and and the elderly and taken many of them captive. And of course, what they'll do for that is then they'll go to Israel and say, okay, well we'll give you. Uh, uh, you know, we'll give you uh, two or three of ours for 50 uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, of our captives, which is your people, for 50 return of, our, uh, of ours. And so, and of course, Israel will do that because they, 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 they love people and they, they don't like to see their people in captivity or anything like that. So let's just take a moment right now to pray for them. We pray, like I said, in that, but as a, as a whole of Word of Faith Family Church, uh, we stand with them, and so uh, when you see something else changing or happening, just lift them before the Lord and help them. So, Father, right now in Jesus' name, we lift Israel to you. 
Lord, we thank you for your love and your goodness, your covenant that you have with the Israelis, with those people, the Jewish people. And Father, we know that there's no distance in prayer, and we stand with them in Jesus' name. Father, we ask that you give them, the, we pray over the military firsthand, Father, that you give them supernatural insight, that you continue to give them right intel, that they'll know ahead of time what things they need to do and they need to take care of. Thank you, Father God, for the right people in the right places, getting the right intel that they need. And Lord, protecting those soldiers, as many of them are very, very young, and Father, I thank you, Lord, for your protection. We just plead the blood of Jesus over them for safety, protection, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray for the families of those that's been uh, impacted by this, uh, many that have lost children and children have lost their parents and grandparents and so on and so forth. Father, we lift them to you, and we thank you for continuing to bring comfort to them and help to them in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you'll surround them with people that will love on them and encourage them and strengthen them. And in the days ahead, we thank you, Father God, for things and situations being been brought to light and being stopped before they even have a chance to progress. And Father, we just thank you for it. We give you praise, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have a covenant with them. They have a covenant with you. And Lord, you'll take care of them and, Father, we'll do our part to pray and lift them up, Father God. And we thank you for what the outcome of this will be as good in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Pastor Rick, come take your liberty, sir. God bless you, man. Also, it is uh, one thing that I, I was hearing and everything is that it also is a 50th year anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, so uh, where they did the same thing, uh, where, you know, the Jewish people and they were in their celebrations and in their special times, and, and in that, that's when they want to wreak havoc, you know? And, and this um, is so. This is the largest attack that Israel has had yeah. since in, since that time. Since 50, then, 50 yeah. Years, so. so we just you know pray for them and. Um, uh, but in the midst of this, uh, it, it's also an exciting time. How many of you know that Jesus is coming back soon? I'm telling you, there is there is more and more um, signs that man. Um, Soon this this is all coming to an end. Uh, of course, we don't know exactly when or whatever, but uh, you know we know that in the Bible it talks about that. Uh, what what are we supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to be aware of the signs. We are supposed to have our our spiritual antennas up to be able to recognize that this stuff is happening for a reason. This isn't just uh, another little war, people. This isn't just a little little thing that happens and, oh, here we go again. No, this is, this is literally, um, you know, we were, um, one time me and Gijay, we were listening to uh, a podcast uh, and, um, of, a, of a special Jewish um, uh, priest, rabbi, uh, con, uh, rabbi, uh, Jonathan Kahn, and he was talking about this, like, before this even happened, and he said, watch. He said, be aware and be mindful and watch that on this day, this time, this special occasion that they were celebrating, that something's going to happen, and it came to pass, you know? Why? Because the Bible sets these things up. It, it, it's all predictions of the Bible that, that the predictions of the coming of the end of times. Amen? And we as Christians, this, it's not a time to mourn. Yes, we, we mourn for the people who lost their lives. And of course, we pray for them. Man, is such a horrible thing. But at the same time, our spiritual lives and our spiritual antennas must be raised and must be aware right? 
we, we always hear about red flags. We need our white spiritual flag to be going up right now. And so what does that mean for us as Christians? One, we pray for Israel. We pray for them. We pray for the protection of, of those people. And we always pray also that whatever is hidden comes to light. Amen? Because the enemy is attacking. He knows that something's coming. He knows that this thing is soon coming to an end. He doesn't know when. He doesn't know what. So what he's going to do is he's going to do his best to stir up fear. He's going to do his best to destroy. Right? And he's going to do his best to not just in, in, over in Israel. I'm talking about us as a people, as God's people, okay? I, I'm talking about us where, where he wants to get our eyes off of the heavenly things. He wants to distract us. Look at all the other stuff outside of Israel that's happening, Right? Man, if, if anyone can say, or any other time, people can say that this world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Okay? Now, man, I tell you, now is the time. We are seeing so much sin. We're seeing so much distortion of the truth. We're seeing so much de defiance of the truth in today's world like never before. And the, the time that we can kind of go back to is Sodom and Gomorrah. To a time where there was absolute defiance of God. Everything that God had set was distorted. Everything that God had done was twisted perverted and we can see that in this time right now that it is becoming more and more and more like that time but what did the bible say the bible says that before jesus comes back it's gonna be like the days of sodom and gomorrah it's gonna be like the days of noah where people didn't care, people didn't believe, they, they were mocking God, they were mocking Noah. When he was preaching, how long did he preach? How long did Noah preach? 120 years. And what were they doing during that time? They mocked him the whole time called him crazy, called him a drunk, where's your God, there's nothing out there, whatever, right? And we can see that in today's, today's day, where God is mocked. People are absolutely mocking God, and they're mocking us. But the Bible tells us rejoice. Amen? Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us that, that when we are, are following after him and when we are speaking the truth, what's going to happen? Persecution. Is persecution a bad thing? No, it's not. Why? Because we're standing up for the truth. We need to stand up for the truth no matter what the cost. It's hard. It's not fun. Especially with, with social media and everything that we have today, right? You can be, you can say one thing and you are blasted and you are quote-unquote canceled in today's world at a blink of an eye. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to say, oh, I, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to you know, offend people? <clears throat> Would you rather offend God 
by not speaking the truth? Or do you want to offend people with the truth? Because the Bible talks about the word being a stumbling block. It's offensive to people. It's offensive to the world. Now, we have to do things in the love of God. So we're not going to just go out there and say, you're going to hell, right? No, we speak the truth in love. We say, hey, there's a better way. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the way that we should go. Why? Because God loves us. He gave his son for us. He, he sacrificed. Jesus sacrificed himself so that we may live and live in a life more abundantly. And when we do that, when we, when we take and we sacrifice ourselves, when we humble ourselves and we do what we need to do to be able to get the truth out there, God will take care of us. He will. The Bible doesn't say that, that we're going to avoid the valley of death. It doesn't say that. It says that we're going to go through it. But as we go through it, He's going to protect us. He's going to keep us. He's going to sustain us. But a lot of us are trying to avoid the valley of the shadow of death altogether. Well, I'm sorry, that's not biblical. And this is, has nothing to do with what I have here. So, <clears throat> But I'm telling you, when we speak the truth, when we go forth and we say hey, your life may be messed up right now, or you know what, maybe it's not even messed up right now. But just because it's not messed up right now doesn't mean that, that we don't seek God. Just because things are going well doesn't mean that we, we can just forget about God and just say, okay, God, and, and then all of a sudden something bad happens, and then we say, oh, God, help me. No. We need to continually seek Him in the good times and the bad. We need to seek Him and we need to, we need to let others know that, hey, God is not just a crutch. He's not a crutch for when you're broken. He's a crutch when you are broken to help you heal but he's also in that to be able to guide you and lead you and help you and sustain you in the times when they're good, too. And when they're good, he can make them, like Pastor says, gooder. Right? And in that, but we need to do our part. We need to do our part. We need to continually seek God. We need to continually have his word in our hearts and in our minds and in our mouth. We need to confess the word of God on a daily basis. Not just when things are bad. Not just when things are, oh God, I don't know what to do. And yes, he is for that time and, and we need to do that. But I tell you, when we do it, when times are good, those times that come that are bad make it a whole lot easier. You know, I think, like, um, you know, I haven't been hunting in a while, and I haven't been hiking in a while, uh, in a long time, but, like, you know, when, when I would go out with Pastor or Michael or something, and we would go, we would go walk in. If I didn't do something beforehand, and I didn't prepare myself in the good times, man, I was struggling. <laughs> Woo! Pastor can attest. Uh, <sighs> you, know, the, you know, hold on a sec, Pastor. I gotta catch my breath. You know. 
But when, but when I prepared myself, then when the time came where I needed to exert myself, I was more prepared. Now, did it mean that it was totally easy? No, no. I, I still struggled. It was still a struggle. But, but it was sustain, I was sustained more. And, and it, it made it easier when I was already prepared instead of trying to prepare in the moment. How many of you know that that doesn't work? Right? <laughs> okay? And in that, even... And it just goes to show that even in the good times, it's work. But when you are, you are forced to, to exude yourself, it's a whole lot easier to do if you're prepared. Do you think people that run marathons just, okay, well, up oh, marathon's tomorrow, time to wake up, time to go run? No. You know what would happen to them if they did that? They would get uh, maybe an eighth of a mile, <laughs> and they'd be like, I'm done. <laughs> I can't. I know I would, at least, you know. Okay? <laughs> no. They train, and they train, and they train, and they do it. They don't do it one week and then stop. Okay, that was a good. That was good enough. Uh, yep, that was good enough uh, exercise and training. Okay. Uh, yep, the marathon's in three months, so uh, I did my training. Uh, you know, three months ago. So yep, I'm good. No. They train. They train weekly, daily, monthly, up until the very day. up until that very day. And here, we as Christians, we do the same thing that the world does. We cry out to God only when we need Him. We, we, we cry out to Him, Oh, God, uh, oh, I don't know what happened. And, you know, God's saying, Well, if you would have listened to me, I would have prepared you. But you didn't want to hearken to my voice. You, don't, you didn't want to take heed to my word. You didn't want to, to do the things that you needed to do on a daily basis. Now, listen, I, I understand, and I'm guilty of this. I, you know, it's, it, sometimes it's not an everyday thing, okay? Sometimes we get busy in ourselves, and we forsake that. But what should be on our mind is, oh, man, I missed it today. Right? Not, not in a condemning way. Not in a way like, oh, my gosh, God's going to strike me down. I missed, I missed it today. No. But in a way that, God, man, I, I missed that time with you today. I'm sorry. And when we do, what do we do? We just step right back into it. and We just keep going forward. And we do what we can. We do the Word of God. We seek Him. We pray. We read the Bible. We fellowship together. That's why it's so important, these life groups. How many of you have loved having life groups back? Man, I tell you, it is... You know, when, you, when we didn't have them for a long time, you know, we get stagnant. We do. Because fellowship together is such an important part. Did you know that that's what the early church did? Yes, in, in their traditions, they went to the synagogue. They, they went and did those things. But what they did even more was fellowship together. And, and it wasn't just, hey, how's it going? Oh, great to see you. Oh, have a good time and stuff. No, they shared with each other the Word of God. They shared what they were doing in their lives. The people they were reaching, they, they fellowshiped together. They, they shared what God was doing in their lives. Why? 
Because it's encouragement. It's encouraging each other with the Word of God. It's encouraging each other with that fellowship. And that's why it's so important. Because the enemy knows that, and so what he does is he'll give you an offense. He'll, he'll, he'll offend you, or you will get offended by something, and then what happens? Isolation. Then what happens? You become the prey. And all of a sudden, pick you off. How many hunters do we have in here? How many know that you don't go for, well, you know, in the animal kingdom, let's just say, okay? In the animal kingdom, a lion doesn't go after the strongest one. He goes after the weakest one. He goes after some kind of defect. He goes after some kind of, of passiveness. He goes after some kind of thing that, that he says, that's the one I want right there. And then he, he's, he's not looking at the other He's not looking at the other animals. He's looking at that one right there. He may glance, okay, he's, okay, that one's getting a little bit, a little bit, you know, further away from that one. So, okay, I'm going to, so he's laser focused on his prey. Preoccupied. And what happens if that animal is not attent, attentive? What happens if, if that animal is just straying away from, from the other herd or the other group. Yep, he becomes lunch. Well, that's the same thing with us guys. That's the same thing with us as Christians. We must stay unified together. We must be in the Word of God so that the offenses when the offenses come, we can recognize it and we can say, no, not today. Remember the song, you know, uh, what, the devil's, you know, not today, whatever, not today, Satan, whatever, okay. <clears throat> and, so, and so with that, we, we must do our part. We must get in the word of God. We must stay unified together that's why it's so important to come to church. You know, we don't, listen, even us as pastors, we don't come to church because, because you know, our, we have that pastor title, and we say, okay, well, you know, I have this title, so I have to go to church. No, we don't care about the title. We care about the congregation. We care about you. We care about the fellowship. We care about eating together. Amen. Come, that was, come on, Pastor, that was your cue to give that big old amen, you know? Right? <clears throat> amen. You know? I, I mean, we care about that stuff because it's important. It's important to us as Christians because that's part of our lives. That's how we grow. We grow because we're around you. We grow with each other, not just as pastors and stuff, but like just as a just as a congregation, just as Christians. We grow when we are around those who are like minded. It's so important to that because you know what? You may have a testimony that I need to hear that will encourage me. And I may have something that I went through that I can share that, hey, you know, man, you know, this has been going on and stuff, and I just, man, I just don't know what to do. Hey, you know what? I went through that. Let me help you. Let me show you the Word of God that helped me get through the same situation. May not be exactly the same, right? We all have different lives. We all have different experiences. But the Word of God is the same. And he sustains us in that. So that's why it's so important to fellowship. That's why it's so important to, to take those times to open up your home to people. To be able to say, hey, listen, 
you know, why don't you come over this weekend? Hey, why don't you come over tonight? It doesn't have to be an organized thing. Hey, come on over. Let's fellowship together. Why? Because one, we are people, we are a human being, and we need fellowship. We need that fellowship. And two, when we share with each other the Word of God, we encourage each other, we lift each other up, and we grow. And we grow in God. And we spend that time, and, and we can have that relationship, not just with each other, but with God Himself. <clears throat> because now we're understanding God more. We're reading His Word we're finding out who he is and who we are in him. And man, when we do that, God's like, that's my child. That's where I want to be. I want to be in the midst of them. Amen? Amen. Isn't God good? All right, sermon number two. Uh, <laughs> So, so we've been we've been talking about clean, um, and uh, that's been our our theme, and um, and in that there are many facets of clean, and of course righteousness is part of that. Righteousness is you know of course we know the 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 regular definition that we you know we as Christians talk about being in right standing with God. So when we are righteous, when, 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 when Jesus made us righteous, okay, that means that our sins are forgiven. When we receive him, our sins are forgiven, and now we are back in right standing with God. Why? Because Adam messed it up. Through Adam, sin came into this world, and messed up our righteousness. But through Christ, we now have that righteousness restored. Isn't that good? And amen to that, because, man, I tell you, where would we be without him? Where would we be without Christ? Yep, definitely worse off. So, so let's take a look at this here and everything. So the adjective is, uh, there's an adjective, or, or I'm just going to read here, um, morally justified. Morally justified. In today's world, how many of you know that morals is not a part of this earth right now? Morals have been thrown out the window. They have been thrown to the ground, stomped on, crushed, and buried. In the world. But because we are in Christ, morally has been justified, has been brought back, has been restored. And, like many people think, morals is not subjective it's objective there's right there's wrong there's no your truth there's no my truth there's no no truth there is only the truth whether people want to believe it or not there that's not up to them they can say anything that they want well, it's just my truth. You know, we hear that a lot in today's world. You know, well, it's just my truth. You know, and I, what does that even mean? That just means your opinion. <laughs> and your opinion can change from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. Feelings can change from one minute to another. You could be happy one minute, that's a feeling. Oh, I'm just happy. And then something immediately can happen that can take that away in a blink of an eye. Yeah. 
but that's not where we live. We don't live in our feelings. We don't live according to the world's version of truth. We live according to the Word of God, which is the truth. There is no other book in the world that is as solid as the Bible. People, people try to, to say, well, it, it, there's so many different, you know, and of course, even, either, even some religions say that the, the, that the Bible is, uh, what do you call it, like uh, corrupt, you know, or uh, there's just, what's that? Yeah, irrelevant. But like, there's, there's mistakes in the Bible, so, because it says that God is a God of love, but yet he slaughtered a whole nation. But people just don't understand that before he slaughtered them, he gave them 50 million chances to change. And it wasn't that he just slaughtered them or, or you know, let them be killed and everything. They were fighting against his chosen people. He was protecting his people. But he gave them chances to repent and to go his way. And sometimes there's just consequences in this world that happen, not because of God, but because of our choices. We have choices in this world. And whether you're a Christian or not, you have consequences to your actions in everything that we do. Anyways. <clears throat> so moral concern with principles of right and wrong or conforming to standards of behavior and character based on those principles. So, so what, you know, in that, you know, I was just kind of looking at that and, and saying... Man, you know, we, a lot of people today have no concern about the moral standard. They have no concern about anything that is right. But we as Christians, that's what we are here to stand up for. We are to show people and be that light in this world to say, hey, listen, if you do this, there's natural consequences that are going to happen, right? And, and I'm trying to save you from that. You can't tell me what to do. Who are you to judge me, right? I hear that a lot. You can't judge me. Only God can judge me. Well, you really want him to judge you before I judge you, <laughs> Right? I'm trying to help you out here so that you don't get judged by him in the wrong way. Trying to help you out. But what do they do? It's called self-righteousness. They have righteousness, but it's self-righteous. Yep. Bible talks about that, being wise in their own eyes. They think that what they're doing is right because they don't know the truth. And that's what we're here for. Amen? <clears throat> godly admirable. Being righteous is godly admirable. Admirable. Sorry, that's a little tongue twister for me. Clean-handed, guiltless, innocent, free from evil or guilt. That's what he has made us. Man, isn't that good? I, I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot in here anyways, but, you know. Um, but when I, was, um, when I was doing victim services, um, you know, I was in court a lot, and, you know, you go in, and, you know, you sit there, and you see these people that, you know, have done some horrible things and everything, and they're like, I didn't do it. I, I'm, 
I'm innocent. Yeah. I'm not guilty. Well, that doesn't mean you're innocent, right? You just say you're, you're not guilty. Um, you know, and, but like, but like, think about that in a moment, for a moment. Imagine all of us here, the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. So we're all guilty in that we were guilty in that instance. But did you know, and, and in that, when we're all guilty, what is the penalty of that? Death. What is death? Separation from God. But did you know that Jesus is our advocate? So what happens is, is he comes and he stands before the judge, which is God, and says, hey, I paid that price. They're innocent. Because Jesus died, because he was sacrificed, and because he rose from the grave, he became our righteousness, and through him, we have been made righteous. We have been made clean, guiltless, innocent, and free from evil or guilt. How many people live their lives feeling so guilty, feeling so condemned, feeling so worthless because of, quote-unquote, the things that they have done in their lives? Man, imagine, though, the feeling of freedom that one can have knowing that if they're in Christ, there's no guilt. The Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for the sinner. No. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, there's condemnation. And there are many people out there in the world today that are feeling condemned. They're feeling worthless. They're feeling, you know, man, what, what is my purpose in life? And here we are as Christians, come to church Sundays. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is so good but we're not even sharing it with other people that need it. Ouch. Awfully quiet. Being saved and being in Christ is not fire insurance. You've heard me say it. You've heard others say it. It's not fire insurance, guys. It's not what it's for part of it. It's a benefit of it. <clears throat> but our duty, our duty as Christians is to speak the truth to people and to lead them to the truth. You see someone hurting, go talk to them. Show them the way. Show them that there's a God that loves them. You know, I was um, I was in Oklahoma when I, when I was living in Oklahoma. Uh, I went to a gas station, and um, uh, there was a really nice car um, right next to me, and uh, and this car was probably about ten to twenty times worth. Uh, more than my car that I had. Um, and God said, 
wants you to pay for his gas. I'm like, he should be paying for mine, right? <laughs> like, like, God, I, I thought you were going to say, like, I'm going to send him to pay for your gas, right? Like, you know, um, he said, pay for his gas. I was like, this is weird. Like, uh, why would I go to this person that clearly has way more money than I do and pay for his gas? God, and, you know, here I am arguing with God like that, you know, really quick in my head, you know, and I'm just like, God, I don't, he doesn't need my money. He said it's not about that. It's about your it's about my love and you showing my love to him i didn't know who he was and everyone you know a lot of people you know gj um comes and you know when when we first moved uh to the states and stuff uh you know and being in oklahoma you just kind of figure everyone's a christian you know <laughs> it's the bible belt i mean there's there is literally probably more more uh, churches in Oklahoma, and especially like in the Tulsa Broken Era, than there are houses here in, in Lander, right? Like, there's just so many, okay? Uh, I am exaggerating a little bit, but not by much, okay? <clears throat> so I go, and I'm, I am shaken. I'm like, uh, hey, I, I, you know, I just need to stop you for a second and everything, and uh, I just you know, want to let you know that, um, you know, I know, I said, I know this is weird and everything, but I, I, I want to pay for your gas. He was like, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't need it and everything. I said, I, 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 you may not need it and everything, but that's not the point. I said, I just want to pay for your gas. And his eyes were just like, what? Why? I said, just want to let you know God loves you. He's like, he was speechless. He was like, I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Just move aside and, you know, <laughs> here you go, right? God didn't tell me to, to preach and to say you're a sinner. I don't know, you know. He didn't do any of that. But he just said, show him my love. And that was it. And I did it and shook his hand and just say, again, I just want to tell you, God loves you. I don't, I don't know what else to say or whatever, but that's, that's all I got for you. He was like, well, thank you. you know, he, we didn't get into a conversation. We didn't get into his life. We didn't get into any of that. Now, I will tell you that if we did, I was ready for it. So we must be ready, and we must be obedient. We, we, we have to do it, because we are God's hands and feet. Yes, God is all-powerful, blink of an eye, snap of the finger. In any second, he can do whatever he wants. But did you know that there are certain laws that he lives by? And he says, you are my hands and feet. I need you. Ugh, that just blows some religious minds saying, oh, God doesn't need us. Oh, yeah, technically he doesn't. But he wants to. He wants to use you. He wants to, to see others come to the knowledge of him through you. Because it does, it's, it's kind of like a twofold thing, you know. Uh, you know we've heard this say before, uh, uh, a pipe, when water goes through it, it gets wet, right? It's just a, a tool, it's just a channel to be worked through. The end result is that other person being blessed, but in the midst of it, we get blessed too. Now, we don't do it to get the blessing, but it's just a natural cause and effect. It's just a natural law from God that when we obey him, 
things just automatically come through us or come to us. We get wet. We get, we get saturated. And the more that we do, what happens if water doesn't throw, flow through a pipe for a long time? Mm, dry, and then what happens? What happens to a metal when you don't use it? It rusts. And then what happens when it rusts? It falls apart. You know, I, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, I know a lot of you weren't here when we first came, but when I first came, I did a preaching, and I had a, a, a picture of a, a tra two tractors, and they were the exact same model, 1970-something, John Deere. One was all nice and green, and same year, nice and green, and then another one was all rusty. And the point was, is one was being used, the one that was all nice and, and still moving, still going, and the other one was not being used. It was the same model, built the same year. But one wasn't functional because it wasn't being used. So are you the tractor that's being used? Or you won that, eh, some, I, I may have to do a little bit of work to get going here, right? <laughs> but if you let it sit too long, it's going to rust, fall apart, break, not going to work. But sometimes, you know, eh, maybe you haven't been used in a little bit. There's still hope for you. Put a little bit of oil here. You may have to drain some old oil. You have to drain some old stuff, the old liquid that may be sitting in there that may be me doing some bad damage. You may have to change a, um, a rubber piece, you know, rubber hose or something that may got dried out. But boy, when you do change that thing, all of a sudden it starts to flow again. Hear those pistons pumping then we can get to work. Amen? Amen? That was a little bit different, and I, I didn't even get through hardly anything here on what I had, but God is so good, guys. He's so good that it compels us to use him not in the way that the world would use. He doesn't abuse us. We don't abuse God. He's not a magic trick type of God. He, he's not, hey, look what I have here, boom, you know, and all smoke show and everything, but on the back end, it's really just sleight of hand. No. He's, he's the real deal. He's a God of miracles. He's a God of wonder-working power. He's a healing God. He's a restorer. How many of you, I, I love those shows where they take these old, beaten up, you know, rusty bucket, you know, uh, dump, you know, cars from the dump and do a lot of work, restore them, change those tubes, change those linings, change the seats, change. He restores. Amen. He's a God of restoration. But did you know that we have to do our part? If we don't get ourselves into the garage, if we're just there in the field. If we are just sitting there, not being useful, not doing anything, nah, I don't want to do that. Ah, I don't know what they're going to say. Ah, I don't know what they're going to do. Oh, I may lose some friends. Sometimes you got to do that to go forward. Sometimes you have choices in your lives that you have to make that seem like going backwards. 
but it's really a God just pulling you back until it's time to let you go, right? But we have to do our part. We have to be available. We have to get into the Word of God. We must spend time with Him. We must be obedient, and we must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And when we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, He speaks things to us that will save us a whole lot of suffering. I didn't say trials. But sometimes when, if we obey him and we listen to the Holy Spirit that he's speaking to us, that he wants to speak to us, that he wants to lead us, he wants to save us from the utter failure that if we either don't do something can happen or if we, you know, are, are doing something that we shouldn't be and he's telling us, no, don't. He's trying to help us. He's trying to save us. He's trying to guide us. And so when we listen to him, when, we, when we're going his ways, then... Man, it, it'll just save us so much frustration. It'll save us so much effort and time <laughs> that that is wasted. Uh, let me just read some scriptures here. It says, James 4, 17, it says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not, to him it is sin. And we can say the same thing of the opposite. If If... You know, if you know to do something and you don't do it, then it's sin. But if you're doing something and you know you shouldn't do it, that's also sin. Right? <clears throat> Psalms 106, um, verse 3, it says, Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness all the time. So righteousness is being made right with, with God, but at the same time, it's a continuous thing. We, we have to continue to seek what is righteous. We have to continue to seek what is good. We have to continue to do what is good. We can't just say, okay, here we go. We're good. Uh, God made me righteous, and I'm all good. Praise the Lord. I'm going to heaven, right? Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, and this is Paul saying, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? What does he say? Certainly not. No. No way. Not in any shape or form. How shall we try? How shall he, we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, uh, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Man, that is so good. We are justified. His grace is sufficient for us. And thank God for grace, because if it wasn't for grace, we wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for His mercy and His grace... And I know many of us can say that. Many of you can say that. But his grace is there. But it's not there so that we can just continue to do what we've always been doing. It comes so that it can transform us into what he wants us to be. Amen? And thank God that his way is better than our way. 
Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet. <clears throat> Stand to your feet. God is so good. He loves us. He cares for us. And we know that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. Each one of us. No matter what you've done, no matter the things in your life that you're going through now, no matter the things that you have been through in the past, doesn't matter the mistakes that you have made, sometimes there's still natural consequences in our lives that that, that we have to deal with. But also at the same time, God can take those consequences and change them. And he can turn them into something good. He can take whatever has happened and turn it back into good. Why? Because we learn from it. We learn from our mistakes. I don't let my kids not make mistakes. I don't force them to make mistakes. The Bible clearly says, parents, don't provoke your children. But at the same time, if they don't obey, there's consequences. <clears throat> but there's also grace there's also mercy. And that's where we as parents, we have to have that balance. It's not all judgment. <laughs> right? <laughs> sometimes it feels like it to them. And sometimes it feels like it to us when we make mistakes. But just know that God is not a condemning God. Just because you feel bad for something that you've done doesn't mean that God doesn't love you anymore. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants the best for you. And when we follow him, when we say, okay, God, yep, messed up big time. Uh, I need you. He's there. Aren't you glad that he's there? Like, I, I, I mean, you know, this world, man, they, for one way right now, they have no hope. But it's up to us to show them what that hope is and who that hope is. Amen? Amen. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, for loving us, for caring for us, for leading us and guiding us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word that teaches us the truth, that guides us, that, that speaks into our lives, Father God, to be able to change us. And Father, we just thank you that you have made us righteous. Thank you, Father God, that you have given us a hope. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the victory over sin. And we thank you for that. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know this hope, maybe you're watching online, maybe you don't know this hope or, or being, what exactly being justified is, or, or maybe you have never experienced that, I want you to know that Jesus has done that for you. And he is a free gift. He is a free gift. And if you receive him, he will make you righteous. So I want you all to pray this with me today. Father, I thank you that your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins for my wickedness and I thank you that because he did that in confessing him 
as my Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross, rose from the grave. I receive him in my heart through his Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. Change me. Make me righteous. And help me to be the person that you want me to be. I trust in you. I have faith in you. And I know that from this day forward, my life will never be the same. I thank you that when trials come, when temptations come, that you will give a way of escape. Because my faith, my trust is in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't God good? He's so wonderful. He's so loving. He's so kind. So as you go today, be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Be aware. Be sensitive to hear his voice and to be led by him. Amen. Amen. Well, have a wonderful day. Be blessed. Uh, for those that are going to life groups today, go expecting, be encouraged. Amen. Have a great day.